I am so glad to be here today. My name is William Alberk. I am the director of the Nonproliferation and Nuclear, um, Nuclear Policy Program. Sorry, it's still a new title. I just got my business cards. I'm so excited to be a part of the IISS family. This is my first time in Arundel House here. Uh, you may know that the NPNP function actually sits in Berlin as part of IISS Europe. Uh, our effort to um, reach out to more European audiences with uh, the IISS mission. Um, I will be uh, very honored to take up the mantle of my very distinguished predecessors in the job uh, and hope to do excellent work there. As part of this work, we have an extraordinary workshop that we've put together today on re-engaging North Korea on its nuclear and ballistic missile capabilities. You see from the agenda today, we have three sessions. We're going to talk about the context and North Korea's perceptions. Um, we're going to talk about strategies for engagement next steps, confidence building and verification measures and closing remarks. Um, for those of you online uh, who are uh, watching us here, uh, please use the Q&A box to send us questions. Uh, we are, um, we'll do this. It, Please type your questions in the Q&A and I'll read through them and read them for you. Uh, as much as I'd love to turn the floor over to folks virtually, it does become a little bit tricky sometimes uh, as to whether their uh, systems are working, whatever. It just, I think, would go much more smoothly if we have Q&A uh, in the box. But we will have some virtual participants, uh, some folks who will not be in the room, uh, including um, Robert Gallucci, who will be on our first session. So without further ado, let's turn to our first session, uh, the context and the North Korean perception. We have two great speakers, um, Robert Gallucci, who I think all of us know very well um, from his service in government, um, as well as being a distinguished professor at Georgetown, a uh, fantastic writer. Um, and I greatly enjoyed reading the piece that you wrote for this session. Uh, and also speaking here live, we have, uh, Professor Andrei Lankov from uh, Kukman University also read a very interesting uh, paper about North Korean perceptions. Um, so we'll have both the speakers uh, speak, and then we will go to the Q&A. Uh, so if I could start off with Professor Gallucci, please. Uh, thank you very much. This before with North Korea, so uh, tell <laughs> us uh, what are the lessons and, and how do we move forward? All right, I'm assuming you can hear me. And uh, thank you for including me uh, with this wonderful group. Uh, and I will make some brief remarks about where we are and where we could be headed. Um, one of the things that struck me is how you started that um, I've been at this a long time at this meeting, either working on or thinking about um, the idea of negotiating <clears throat> with North Korea to settle our outstanding issues. And it has occurred to me that um, over this 30 years, we have had um, <clears throat> three generations of Kims um, and five different American presidents, uh, all of whom have, uh, I guess the word is engaged in one way or another with the DPRK. And I don't know what else we learned from that observation, but one thing we should learn is that we should have learned something. I mean, we should know something about how to start negotiations, how to sustain negotiations, what to do and what not to do. Uh, it just stands to reason. There's there are a lot of people you could in Washington. The <clears throat> the the talking head economy uh, brings us all together talking about this fairly frequently. Uh, that said. Uh, I, I don't know anybody who thinks we're in a particularly good place right now. Uh, we seem to be on a plateau, and that is giving us credit for having reached some elevation. I, but no, we seem not to be going any, anywhere. I would suggest that uh, with the wonderful people we have at this meeting, this conference, uh, we start by asking what our goal is and see if we can't agree on what it ought to be, what we're aiming for. Because if we get that wrong, it's not, <laughs> it's not gonna be very good even if we succeed. And I think our goal has, uh, should be what it has been for 30 years, 
uh, more or less. And that is to <clears throat> get a, uh, a denuclearization of the North. I, I'm gonna try to avoid CVID, comprehensive, verifiable, irreversible um, denuclearization, because I'm not sure what all those words actually mean. Um, I know what I mean, and I, what all I mean is um, a verified removal of nuclear weapons material and production capability, um, and the same for uh, ballistic missile production and uh, capability to produce uh, and, and extended range ballistic, ballistic missiles. And that's a pretty straightforward thing. But in Washington, where I've referred to the, my fellow talking heads um, uh, meeting and talking about this, there is a, um, a new view, and I'm not sure how new it is, but it, it is a different view about what our goal should be. And, and that is that we should accept what is obvious to many people, and that is that North Korea, two things, has nuclear weapons, maybe even thermonuclear weapons, and that it is not going to give them up. They've worked too hard over too many decades to just uh, be so uh, absorbed in a negotiation uh, with the United States of America that they'll give it all up. So the, the substitution goal uh, that is uh, increasingly popular, it seems to me, is arms control that we try to do with the uh, North Koreans in an analytical sense, what we've tried to do with the, uh, uh, first the Russians and then the Soviets and would like to do, I, I guess, with the Chinese as well. And that is um, negotiate some terms of, a, of an agreement which will stabilize the strategic relationship. Um, to say that that's the goal is of course to accept uh, the DPRK as a nuclear weapon state uh, and seek uh, to create conditions in which uh, there's less risk of these nuclear weapons being used. I think it's worth talking about that uh, and seeing where various people today uh, at this meeting stand on that proposition. I'm not opposed to the idea of making the world safer, but I uh, must say that I, uh, I, I, I like version A better than version B of our goals. And uh, unless you want to encourage circumstances that will um, attract the Japan and the Republic of Korea to nuclear weapons acquisition, I, I would suggest that we hold on to our goal of um, denuclearization as it is popularly understood which is uh, to have a North Korea, which is um, declared by itself and by observers um, to be without nuclear weapons and without the capability to produce them quickly. I, the word ir irreversible has always confused me. I, I don't know what that really means. If they built them once, presumably they haven't forgotten how and uh, those scientists are still around. So it's not irreversible, but they would have to start again. That's what I'm saying. Would, the, the facilities would have to be dismantled in such a way that they would have to be constructed all over again. That's what I'm looking for. And the verification part, let me say a word about that. I'm very enthusiastic about verification. Always have been, uh, you know, I think of my days with UNSCOM and with Nikita, where we worked on um, inspections and monitoring and verification and all that sort of thing. And I'm, I'm, I'm into it. However, I, I learned then, if I didn't know before, that we have to be realistic. Nuclear weapons, it turns out, are very small objects. Uh, a nuclear weapon is not an enrichment, uranium enrichment centrifuge building or, or God knows cascades of gaseous diffusion. It's, it would fit under, I have my, um, my little computer on a table. The nuclear weapons I have seen would easily fit under this table, easily. And uh, there are a lot of tables in North Korea. So we have to be, <laughs> I think we have to insist that what our goal is gonna be that the North Koreans uh, allow sufficient access and the other requirements of, of uh, adequate inspection, but we need to be realistic about where you could possibly get to. And what you can get to is um, the declaration, access, 
uh, to places they may have it. But even if they keep fissile material, um, that shortens, as we know from all those time frames that have applied in the Iranian case, the availability of fissile material collapses the time it would take to regenerate a weapons program. So let's be reasonable about this and understand what's physically possible. But um, I also think that the lesson of 30 years is that if the North uh, Koreans um, do not believe that for all we want in denuclearization, they are truly going to get something that you might call permanent and not easily reversible normalization. Um, and the, uh, the rest of that sentence is, and if they don't get real normalization, and I, I mean where we regard ourselves as regarding North Korea as a normal state, uh, which it has never been, but uh, if it could get there, uh, that would be the circumstance in which I think we can get true denuclearization. If we do not, we get what I think we got after the 1994 agreed framework, which you'll forgive me for having a certain um, uh, uh, sympathy for. Uh, but the, the problem was, I think, and is still, that if the North does not believe they have a normal relationship, they have truly, it's not just a treaty of peace should we ever get one, and it's not just the absence of sanctions, it's not just the um, absence of threatening exercises between allies uh, allied against North Korea. It is true normal relations. If they don't get that, they will, because they are in uh, uh, Kenneth N. Waltz's state of nature, they will hedge. And they may even cheat. And you know, for most of us, that's what happened uh, when they, forgive me, but correctly perceived that they didn't get real normalization. Uh, and uh, that's not where we want to be again. Um, having said that, I don't think normalization can be done quickly. Normalization will be a process. It will have milestones, which we, uh, most of us here, or all of us here, could lay out what those milestones are likely to be. It will take time. <laughs> what I particularly want to say is that we can't plan on meeting for lunch and doing normalization. Uh, I mean, whether it's Hanoi or it's Singapore or anywhere else, this is not a lunch meeting. You know, the agreed framework, uh, which eventually failed, uh, took a, you know, a year and a half or so of talking on and off. I don't know this has to take a year and a half. It may have to take longer and we should be prepared for that. The second thing I think is that we are in being realistic about the process of normalization and serious normalization. Not only will it take time, but it's going to have to involve the evolution of North Korea's human rights policy. Now, that's a tough one for some people like uh, once myself, I said denuclearization is hard enough without adding uh, good human rights policies uh, to the list of things we might have to achieve. But I'm sorry, I am persuaded, uh, have been persuaded that if we do not persuade the North uh, that adjusting how they treat their own people, uh, then we will never have normalization. The United States will not have normal relations with a country that's running gulags. It's just not gonna happen. And we know that really, and they know it too. Um, I once, you know, a North Korean once asked me in a track two meeting or one and a half meeting, uh, he's one I had known in the negotiations uh, some years before, but he said, why should we ever trust you? And I, I, I said, well, you, you're gonna have to do something for us to make us trustworthy. That's right, you will have to do something for us to make us trustworthy, and that is to improve your human rights policy, not to some perfect image of how uh, states ought to be structured, but to something that at least meets minimum UN standards. And you are not yet there. And, and of course, the North Korean responded with, well, there you go again, wanting to change our regime. Well, wait a minute, that's not what regime change has meant for the North before, but this would be a change and we have to recognize that. We have to recognize also it, that is not going to be easy. Uh, I don't wanna get into what the quid pro quos would be on the road to uh, a uh, resolution to the outstanding issues. 
we know them, uh, and I think others will do this better than I, the, the, the lists include sanctions relief and exercise relief and a peace treaty and lot, lots more on, on both sides. Um, but please understand uh, that um, we have to remember what I had, I've already noted, that um, we can only do reasonable things. And one of the unreasonable things that some of my um, colleagues who are experts on the technical side particularly have insisted is that we start as UNSCOM started, if I can put it that way. For those of you who remember the UN Special Commission, uh, under the resolution 687, the Iraqis were required to make a declaration of all, all those uh, capabilities, facilities, material that were prohibited under resolution 687 of the United Nations Security Council. So people have said the first thing we got to achieve is a declaration. The North has to say what they've got and where it is. And I want to say, no, that is not the first step. That is way down the, the list of things that happens. It is logically a first step. I get that as a former inspector, but it is not politically uh, at all plausible. Uh, it is uh, not reasonable to expect the North Koreans to give us a list, which can either be a very useful guide for monitoring and verification or be a target list for a preventive strike. And they won't know which at the very beginning. So we should, uh, we should look for milestones and we should take a milestone, a substantive one as being important. And eventually we'll get to a list and we might be able to build that list, but insisting that we start that way is the wrong way to go, I think. Um, About the overall goal of the North, if I'm saying we are gonna to stick to ours, their goal of normalization, I, I would like us to adjust our thinking a little. So this does not become their goal. And our goal is on the other hand, denuclearization. Our goal should, yes, it should be denuclearization, but it should be normalization as well. I mean, we should be as enthusiastic as getting away from sanctions, which as a, any number of people have noted, are not an end in themselves. We don't want a permanent situation, in which we handicap the, the North's capabilities by a sanctions regime and scare them with exercises. That's not where we want to be. We truly want in Northeast Asia, normal relations. Yes, between, between the United States and, and North Korea, but also between South Korea and Japan. And, and it's a situation which will, lead to the stability that I think all of us want. It may not be exactly uh, the vision that exists in Beijing of how they'd like political relations to evolve in Northeast Asia. I suspect that at least some in Beijing are very fond of the idea of having a buffer state in North Korea uh, that is opposed to South Korea, an ally of the United States, and certainly to the United States without having a war in, in Northeast Asia. I don't suggest the Chinese want that, but they may not want something that we and the South uh, say we want, and that is a normal relation, normal relations with North Korea. Um, finally here, I wanna remind everyone, anyone who has truly uh, you know, been engaged, certainly in the United States, but I think in, in many other countries, certainly the, the Republic of Korea, that a negotiation, particularly one in which I predict would be protracted, um, is not going to succeed either as an ongoing matter or as in, in its end game, if it does not have domestic political support. You know, in the United States, we're most familiar with that, what that looks like and what it looks like when you don't have it, is it that you have genuine public opinion, thinking this is a good idea, negotiating with the North Koreans to solve our problem. And you also have um, the Congress generally on your side. Right now, for most of us who have been watching the United States Congress, it is hard to imagine it, no, right, that Congress being on the right side of anything. The sun rising tomorrow could be made controversial and political in the American 
uh, political environment right now. It's quite depressing, but I, I do think that has to be uh, one of the goals. Uh, and if one, it is gonna be one of the goals, then we're gonna have to re resist in the United States, maybe elsewhere, but certainly in the United States, certain impulses we have uh, to deal with the, uh, the sort of inevitable hostility that some people have to solving the North Korea problem, not by sanctions and not by um, our, 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 our own saber rattling and our own exercises, but by negotiations. Uh, there's such, I mean, you don't have to have in the United States political courage to attack people who would presume to negotiate with the DPRK, right? That takes no political courage. It may take some to actually engage the North Koreans. It's kind of like the Iran deal. But you have to be careful. There's an instinct very often to show, if you're a diplomat, how tough you are and to say bad things, nasty things about your negotiating partner. And then when you meet your negotiating partner to say, look, you understand what the political atmosphere is here. You know, you're not particularly regarded as a worthy negotiating partner for us. And so we are naturally being very careful, certainly in what we say publicly. Now, what one does that without wanting to undercut public statements, but it's best actually to simply always tell the truth. And the truth is that we have been in, an, in a, a hostile relationship with the North for a very long time, and we're not going to get out of it in a very short time. And that over that period of time, we may build trust or we may not, don't know. But being straightforward and honest with your public and your legislature, your Congress in our case, I think has got to be part of the plan, the integrated plan of, uh, of the politicians and the diplomats to address this problem. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, and we've already got some questions coming in, but I want to uh, hear from our next speaker before we go to those questions. So please, Professor, take it away. As usual, I'm not going to provide good news. I believe uh, we have been in a tough situation, and the situation is getting worse. Uh, but first of all, uh, let's uh, start from the remarks. Why I personally believe, and for me it's not new, uh, because Professor Galucci said it's a new talk of view in Washington. I have, it has been my loudly expressed view for 20 years. Denuclearization is not going to happen unless regime change is going to happen. And chances for the regime change are quite low now. Why, do, uh, why does North Korea need nuclear weapons? Basically, there are two major and two additional goals. Uh, two major goal is deterrence. They have seen what happened in Afghanistan, which never tried to have nuclear weapons. Well, Taliban came back recently, but I'm talking about Taliban being removed from the power. Uh, they saw what happened in Iraq, where they tried to have nuclear weapons. And above all, they saw what happened in Libya. Because have Libya had nuclear weapons, or even some ambiguity about nuclear weapons, the NATO countries would not intervene into the Libyan domestic crisis. So when people say that nuclear weapons are useless against domestic issues, they are wrong. Because if you have nuclear weapons, you can machine gun protesters. If you don't have nuclear weapons, a human rights lobby will cite responsibility to protect and other new fancy terms, and you are in trouble, probably, not necessary. Nuclear weapon is a guarantee that you can if necessary, machine gun and torture your opponents, and only world media would go wild, but nothing serious can, happens. So deterrence, second blackmail. Uh, sometimes people you, you say, let them eat nuclear weapons. What can I say? Bon appetit. Uh, because it's exactly how they manage to squeeze a lot of aid. Because normally a country of their size, their influence, and their abysmal human rights records would be unable to attract that much aid from the outside world. Unless probably people still help them, but making some conditions on human rights, uh, which are unacceptable for them. So blackmail and deterrence, security and food, two major reasons which are good, survival 
and a sort of prosperity. Two additional, I will mention only briefly, conquest. I believe they have not completely abandoned the dream of taking over South Korea. But unlike many South Korean hardliners, I believe it's a very distant dream they don't take too seriously. It still exists somewhere. And which is often, I believe, is overemphasized, but still present, is domestic propaganda value of the nuclear weapons. So uh, basically, all these figures are of these uh, reasons, especially deterrence, is very, very important. And attempts to use pressure or promises of some kind of material benefits, economic concessions, are not going to work. Why? Because they believe that nuclear weapons are key element of their survival. And you cannot bribe somebody into committing suicide. In order to be rich and successful, you have to be first alive. And they believe that without nuclear weapons, they will be dead very soon. And they are probably right, you know what. Uh, so uh, therefore, you can not negotiate denuclearization. Something I've been saying for 20 years was initially kind of strange memory Russian. Now, well, my mainstream view. Uh, but, but having said that, what can be our goal? In this regard, I'm going to, I belong to this new view, which for, for me is not new. Um, uh, that is the goal should be arms control. So the problem is unsolvable. And as long as the Kim family stay in control of Pyongyang. And the regime change is risky and probably difficult or probably even impossible to arrange. And at least even if we walk towards regime change, if we should walk towards regime change, which is a huge if, uh, but it's a separate issue beyond our today's topic. Uh, but even if uh, we decide that we need a regime change, chances of getting it done are quite low and going down. Uh, so we have to deal with North Korean state as it exists. Very unpleasant, by the way, a very unpleasant place. And our solution is to find some ways of arms control uh, because de de denuclearization is not going to work. Addressing Professor Galuches and many others concerns about impact on um, proliferation, bad impact on proliferation, such a decision will produce. You know what I will tell. We should, we should claim we are negotiating denuclearization while actually negotiating arms control. So on paper, all these agreements, which will hopefully be achieved, will be called the first round one of North Korea denuclearization. You know, we are moving slowly. We, are, we may have made the first step on the winding road. And there is no need to tell too loudly for the officials, not for people like me, uh, uh, that this road is, is a road to nowhere. Actually, there is no road. So on paper, ostensibly, all the negotiate, all the arms control agreements should be packaged and presented to the public media and whoever else as just the first stage of the long negotiation uh, denuclearization process, which will probably minimize the damage to the international non-proliferation regime. Uh, so diplomats will keep flying. We have round five, round 27, round 35. I believe even minor countries can afford a couple of first class tickets for the heads of the delegation and business class tickets for the common diplomats. Uh, so it's not going to be expensive and it will create a necessary illusion which will, which will be quite useful for people to keep us as aspiring nuclear countries under control. And personally, due to the reasons I don't have time to talk about, I don't expect North Korea, sorry, South Korea to go nuclear, even though it badly wants it. Uh, but it will not, it wants, well, you know, everybody wants something, uh, uh, but it doesn't mean that, well, well, I, will, I better not tell what I want, but 
well, everybody can still know, but there are serious reasons for them not, not uh, to do it. So I would not worry for the time being, even though I believe that in the long run, maybe not South Korea and Japan, uh, but Professor Garluchi's uh, um, concerns are well-founded. And for me, the only solution is to make a smoke screen of the fake negotiations uh, which can last for decades. After all, you probably forgot, uh, but United States of America, Russian Federation, Ch uh, People's Republic of China, and uh, uh, United Kingdom, by the way, too, they already made a promise, solemn promise, to work towards the complete denuclearization. According to 1968, non-proliferation treaty, don't remember which article, they all promised to eventually surrender nuclear weapons, maybe another five centuries and we will see it. Uh, so why not, not, not accept in North Korea uh, to, to this glorious club? Uh, but unfortunately, it's probably not going to happen anytime soon uh, because right now conditions for negotiations are worse than before. Because the outside world, even assuming that the outside world is united, and unfortunately, as, as I will tell briefly in a few minutes, it's not united, but even we live in a kind of a, a ideal situation, the outside world had only two kind of incentives. Uh, basically, it's economy, including above all, lifting sectoral sanctions, which were introduced in 2016 and 2017, and really seriously damaging North Korean economy. A second kind of, you know, uh, carrot uh, the world can handle to North Korea is indeed normalization. U.S. Embassy in Pyongyang, everything. I believe that Americans, as usual, gross, grossly overestimate their significance, uh, diplomatic significance and significance of their embassy in Pyongyang. It's not going to be as uh, that important, but it will be nice. It will be nice. Uh, so anyway. However, right now we have sort of bad news. Uh, such agreement, we came very close under Donald Trump, who managed to become a perfect ma madman from President Nixon's madman theory. And he even out madman the master, master madmans from Pyongyang. Uh, but uh, but in this case, we are again drifting away from this short window of opportunity, which I hope, I believe existed, probably I'm not sure, existed, maybe existed recently, uh, because we have a Sina-US conflict. And the Sina-US confrontation is quite bad news uh, because uh, uh, in China, there have always been a deep division among the decision makers. Some people believed that North Korea is more, basically produces more benefits than creates trouble. And other schools said that they create less trouble than, uh, they, so they, create, they produce more trouble than benefits, say pro Pyongyang, anti Pyongyang faction. Now, uh, with the confrontation in the United States, a majority of the Chinese decision makers and analysts believe that China badly needs. Um, a buffer zone next to the border. That China doesn't want instability in North Korea. That China would like to have a reasonably friendly government in North Korea. And of course, they don't want a unification, which in the current situation will be essentially conquest of the poor North by the rich South and a kind of enlargement of the South Korean state. Which is uh, and the South Korean public is now with well anti Chinese feelings are growing in South Korea with surprising speed. They used to be almost completely absent. Now South Korean public opinion is turning against China with a remarkable speed. It is very little visual reasons, but it's happening. Uh, and it's a democratic country. It's deeply nationalistic country. It's pro-American country, which is, in case unification likely remain a U.S. ally. Definitely, South North Korea does. Oh, sorry, China does not need unification. Does not need a Syria-like or Libya-like situation in a nuclear-armed country nearby, and they need a buffer zone. All this is sufficient uh, to ensure that China will pay money to keep North Korea afloat. We are not talking about large amount of money. A uh, few years ago, I was in a, a workshop in Vladivostok in Russia, attended by the official government analysts, independent analysts, and so on. And one of them made a wonderful joke I always retelling. He said, well, people present here, he said, 
are perfectly aware that Russia is with, that we, that Russia are not friends with North Korea right now because as everybody in this room knows, uh, well, because everybody in this room knows how much it costs to be friends with North Korea, about one billion dollars a year. Uh, so I think it's a pretty good estimate, even though I would probably increase the pr price tag to two billion currently. Inflation, you know, uh, but uh, so but this is a small change for the, for China. Uh, there are, have been some hope the Chinese will feel annoyed about this money. It's a small change. They will probably build last one host, ghost town less, it's all. And they will suffer much greater damage if they lose a buffer zone. And if they have U.S. forces stationed in Korea, or even without U.S. forces, if they have a United Korean state which is likely to be reasonably hostile towards China. They don't want it. And one or two billion is a small change. For, therefore, what can we say? Sanctions, which used to be a very powerful tool just recently, have dramatically lost their efficiency. Once North Koreans will start, uh, will uh, basically commence the regular work of their new sanitary, how do you say, uh, so, so dog, uh, disinfection centers, uh, which are being built with, in a great hurry, they will start getting Chinese aid. Not much, because China does not want economic boom in North Korea. They need a stable but weak North Korea. Uh, but they will get enough, it will be a dole, a social security payment. But North Korea will have it, and if they have security of this, and they, this means that they are less interested in getting all kinds of politically risky activities. It's not incidental that over the last two years, we have seen a massive backlash, backlash on the economic reforms North Korean government has implemented over the last decade with a great deal of success. Why? Because reforms are risky. And when you have a doll, there is no need for you to do something which is difficult or dangerous. And it means that we are not, we have, our tools are less efficient than they were just recently. In the long run, probably things will improve, but definitely not until after the end of the COVID epidemics. Right now, right now, we have to understand that North Koreans are not in a hurry to forge any agreement. All the stocks, you know, wishful talks about Sanctions are beginning to bite, you know. I probably should write down all the sentences, so do just a bit of Google search. I have heard a few hundred times for the last 15 years. Sanctions are just beginning to bite. No, they are not. Uh, because what is really biting is their own quarantine policy. Once its quarantine is re re released, they will have Chinese food, Chinese diesel fuel, and some basic supplies, and they can live on this social giveaway, so on the dole, for a few more years. Then probably things will change, but right now I don't expect any serious development or, well, at least it was, and if it's something happens, well, first of all, it's not going to be dramatic. Second, it's going to be costly, not for the North Koreans, but for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. A very uh, sobering assessment of North Korea's um, uh, 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 impetus there. Um, we have a couple questions from online before I turn to the room, um, and let, let me just put the questions out there and then take some questions from the floor and then I'll turn to the speakers. First, uh, from Pavel Podvig asking a question about uh, combining denuclearization and arms control, starting with a ban on the production of fissile materials, um, which could be verified and doesn't require the kind of unscum declaration. Um, and then two questions on similar issues regarding North Korea and human rights. Um, one asking if we should look for human rights in a deal with North Korea, should we look for a deal with um, JCPOA on human rights for Iran? And then um, a, more of a statement about how China would probably also not want to see human rights drawn into the DPRK discussions because of the possible spillover on their own human rights records. So. Uh, holding those, let's see if we have any other questions from the floor that I can then turn into. Please go right ahead. Please press the press yeah the little speaker button. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, good. I, I thank you very much to the panelists, and I, I wanted to ask uh, first of all uh, how far we should be focusing not only on uh, the, the issue of denuclearization 
or arms control, or, or, or rather than uh, delivery systems, uh, because uh, the fact that the uh, North Koreans are increasing the range uh, of their uh, delivery of, new, of potential nuclear attacks, that, that seems to uh, destabilize the international situation considerably. Uh, uh, and I also hope that the speakers could uh, explain uh, the impact of uh, whatever deals that, uh, could be done uh, between North Korea and the United States and uh, other issues uh, such as Iran. Great, thank you. Down the table, please. Thank you. Um, isn't the first step for North Korea to take measures and remove its COVID um, mitigatory strategies, whatever you want to call it. Otherwise, the ball is in Pyongyang's court and it can simply turn inwards as much as it can. This is just feeding off um, the talk given by Professor Lankov. I'll take one more from the floor, please, go ahead. I have a comment and a question. Is it okay, William? Um, so the comment that I want to make is when, when I listen to these speakers, I, I feel like we're thinking too linear when it comes to what, it, what, are the, what are the issues in here and what are the solutions that we need to take. It's almost like A plus B just that takes you to C is like sanctions and pressure that, that should take us to the denuclearization issue. And I have been working on complexity in nuclear weapons thinking. And I think that this is, this is a really complex issue and we should look at it from a wicked problems framework and and i don't think that we are doing this uh a lot um so is it the system that actually is it the security environment that affects and has an impact on north korean um nuclearization or is that is it actually that the nuclearization of north korea that has an you know destabilizing impact on the region itself and i think it's, it is the both um the question that i have is is if you link if you look at the issue as a wicked problem, then actually small things that you might make can have larger impact and larger things that you might think of might actually have smaller impacts that, that you might assume. So the question is, is there any small change that, that could lead to a higher or bigger impact in the long run that, that the speakers see? Thank you. All right, because of time, I'm gonna have to hold the questions there. I've, I've certainly got a bunch of my own as well. And I'm already starting to think that maybe an MBFR for North Korea might be an interesting way forward. But let's turn to uh, Professor Gluchi for uh, answers to the questions. Any final remarks? Um, thank you. Uh, so I think I've, I've got a couple here, but I, I may need to be reminded. The, the first one was, I thought, the, a very reasonable one about why not break down the the process uh, uh, of denuclearization and include arms control. It wasn't put that way, but that's the way I would choose to take it. In other words, I, I've got nothing against arms control. I like arms control. And I, indeed, I think arms control can be, uh, as we understand that process, can be steps along the road. When I, I was, if you recall, I was talking about what the goal should be. And if the goal is, uh, arms control, uh, then you're saying we, uh, you're being at what some people would call a realist. And you're saying this is not, we're not going to get denuclearization. So you, you can it, put it in the box of, of, of the objectives of the nuclear weapon states in the NPT. They have to eventually give up their nuclear weapons, etc. But nobody thinks that's going to happen soon. So if you took the same view here, you can be an advocate for the goal, but really not consider the goal at all viable uh, and instead say, we're really looking for arms control. Okay, uh, so uh, my own view is no, we should be seriously and deeply interested in denuclearization. We recognize it's hard. That should remain the goal politically and realistically. Along the way, we may have steps, particularly at removing fissile material and steps at denuclearizing by dismantling Yang Bian or other things. There's nothing wrong with arms control. It's just that I don't want it to be the end game. About the 
the comparison of the JCPOA and the Iran negotiations to what we want to do with North Korea. And if we think normalization should fit, um, uh, excuse me, if uh, respect for human rights, poli a policy of respect for human rights should fit in the list of objectives with North Korea, why not with Iran? Well, I would say I was driven to this view about human rights being essential after years of watching negotiations fail with North Korea. I didn't start there. I ran from human rights activists who wanted me to put it, put it on my list of goals. So I, I think that if you, if you can achieve what you want in security terms, in only security terms, then asking or insisting that the regime make fundamental changes in its domestic policy uh, may not be necessary and may be counterproductive. I don't know. I haven't really focused on, on Iran in the same way. But eventually, I think the proposition that normalization of relations with Iran requires that Iran uh, comport with international standards on human rights. Yes, I do. Um, I am, uh, uh, I, I read uh, uh, the questions from uh, Professor Lauk too, Dr. Lauk, uh, old friend, Kurt Lauk, and I I'm, I'm in, uh, I guess, deep agreement with him in his observations, um, uh, which you all can, can read. I think we have serious problems in trying to move along the path I'm recommending, but I still recommend that path. I, I think as a, as, um, I'm more than happy to admit to linear thinking, it's, <laughs> I, uh, I, as, a, as we say, a dead white guy, that's what I do. But uh, I, I, I don't know how to get around that. And I don't, I don't know that I completely understood the suggestion. So I, I'm gonna need some help here if I were to respond to that. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, well, talking about arms, what is more important, the nuclear arms or delivery systems? Uh, frankly, I don't know. I'm not an arms control specialist uh, because uh, my impression, which might be wrong, that is nuclear facilities are easier to control, easier to dismantle. Uh, so if we say get uh, young gun facilities dismantled, it will be a major step. Uh, because there are centrifuges um, uh, in, found in other places, basically location is known, and it's possible to uh, negotiate some dismantlement. Of course, uh, they will keep something, they will hide something, they will not dismantle something, but it's easier. How can you basically, what can you do about a submarine production? Well, they will be less willing, especially because everybody around has submarines. And they can say why we are not allowed when, say, uh, South Koreans have it. We are negotiating our eventual denuclearization to be achieved in 250 years. Uh, but uh, why should you pressing us uh, to surrender nuclear submarines when everybody around has, not you know, uh, uh, a missile armed submarines when everybody around has it? And once again, how you can basically, you know, just stop production of missiles. I don't know. I think I simply believe it's more complicated. Ideally, should ways should be pursued. Simply, probably with nuclear weapons, you have some easier keys. Yeah. Um, and talking about environment and denuclearization is partially ex or chicken question. Uh, but having said that, I personally believe that, well, you look, uh, North Koreans began to show serious interest in going nuclear at very early stage. In 1954, 1954, 70 years, almost 70, 67 years ago, uh, they were one of very few countries uh, which accepted invitation of the Soviet military command to send their observers to Tosk exercise, which was the only exercise I assume in the world's history where live nuclear ammunition was used. And the Soviet military uh, uh, headquarters uh, sent invitation to all allies. Very few accepted. North Korea was one of them. In the late 1950s, they began to train nuclear scientists. In the early 60s, uh, in, in the newly declassified Soviet cables from the Soviet embassy, you could see that a very smart uh, Russian ambassador there, Moskovsky, he began to, care, to feel something that they dream about going nuclear. 
So it's, you know, it's going 60, 60, 60 decades when the international environment was completely different, but they still wanted it. The goals were different. They probably wanted more independence from China and Russia. They probably took conquest liberation, quote unquote, of the South more seriously, but it has been a long, long hold goal for them. Even though once again, it's basically probably X and uh, chicken issue. And finally talking about the goals. Well, I probably, well, if it's better to, if it helps somebody to uh, believe that we are working towards arms control as the first stage towards denuclearization, why not? Why not? It doesn't make any harm. Um, well, after all, once again, United States has been working and other nuclear powers, working very hard to achieve denuclearization since 1968. You see massive successes. So. Well, thank you very much. I'm afraid I've let this session go on a little bit too long. So if you don't mind um, going to skip the coffee break, if you have to jump out uh, or if you want to go grab some coffee during the session, uh, please go ahead. But uh, thank you very much for both our speakers. Thank you for the questions. Uh, we're going to roll right uh, away then into the next session, which is on strategies for engagement and next steps. Uh, two speakers, uh, the Director of Nonproliferation from the Arms Control Association, Kelsey Davenport, who will join us online, uh, and of course, Terrence Taylor, the former President of the International Council of Life Sciences and a good friend of IISS. Kelsey, with that, let me turn to you, please. Well, thank you so much, William, and thanks to IISS for hosting this and having me. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but I certainly appreciate the opportunity to participate all the way from the, the western coast of the United States, so it's great, great to be with you. So before we talk about strategies for engagement and next steps, I think it's just worth recapping briefly, you know, where are we on, on engagement? And I actually think the signs are looking a bit more promising now than they were, you know, two to three months ago. You know, first, we have the Biden administration, you know, saying consistently that they're willing to pursue talks with North Korea without preconditions, uh, and now beginning to say that they've put some specific offers on the table for North Korea, uh, which I think is important to ensure that, um, that, that the door kind of remains clearly open for diplomacy. And there's some signs now on the North Korean side that Pyongyang may be moving back towards engagement, you know, despite this uptick in missile testing. You know, some of the language that North Korea is using, we're seeing a move away from deterrence, um, back towards kind of a balance of power language and des describing military capabilities, which is much more similar to what we saw in, in 2017. And also some gestures towards South Korea that again are indicative of, of a greater willingness to talk. So how can we capitalize on this possible con convergence um, to actually advance diplomacy? You know, on the US side, one thing that I, I, I wanna emphasize at the beginning, because I think you know, it, it's important and it's a troubling trend that we're seeing in nonproliferation and arms control, is that the United States has been tending to uh, pursue transactional processes you know, within their negotiations and expecting transformational results. Or in the converse, they're pledging to pursue a transformational process, uh, but actually pursuing a, a, a transactional bargain. And, and I think that this is problematic for, for several reasons. You know, first, it creates an imbalance in expectations that can undermine the success of a process. So if we look at the nuclear deal with Iran, for instance, this was designed and approached as a transactional process. You know, it traded restrictions on Iran's nuclear program you know, for sanctions relief. But the expectation was that the deal would end up modifying Iran's behavior in the region. So the disconnect there you know, really led to a lot of opposition to the deal that ultimately led the United States to, to, to withdraw from it. You know, second, you know, we've seen that mixed messaging between um, transformational and, and transactional processes, you know, can stymie progress within the negotiations themselves. You know, and a prime example of this actually is some of the action that we saw um, after the, the, the Singapore summit between Trump and Kim. You know, in the Singapore summit declaration, we saw the United States and North Korea, you know, commit to a more transformational process, a fundamental change in the relationship. But in the follow-up, we saw the United States move much more towards a transactional process that imposed, tried to impose sort of high costs to North Korea up front um, with an unclear reward. Um, and then third, I would just say that misalignment can create a lot of challenges uh, within the United States, you know, specifically with, with the US Congress. 
And this is critical because we're seeing a trend in Congress towards impeding presidential flexibility in such negotiations, uh, not just with North Korea, but kind of across the nonproliferation and arms control spectrum more broadly, um, by putting conditions on sanctions lifting and putting conditions on how the president can, um, can, can deal with, with security dynamics. North Korea, for instance, you know, we've seen this play out um, uh, with um, you know, legislation that tries to prevent any changes in troop deployments in South Korea, uh, prevent any changes in military exercises, for instance. So once, you know, so the, the critical thing in here is that, you know, if we pursue a transactional or transformational process, that we stick to it, that the steps are aligned uh, to actually meet that goal, and then it's communicated sort of clearly and consistently. Now, in terms of North Korea, it, it appears that the U.S. goal is transformation. I mean, the Biden administration has provided very few details about their North Korea policy review, but what they have said publicly is that the United States tends to base its approach on the Singapore summit declaration and work incrementally, which again suggests the goal here of a transformational relationship, the pursuit of denuclearization and, 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 and peace building kind of under this guise of, 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 of a new kind of relationship between the US and North Korea. Now, certainly a transformational approach for North Korea is going to be more complex because of the broader parameters. But, but I do think that this is the right move and that this is the strategy that the Biden administration should, should commit to. I mean, we don't know at this point if North Korea is actually willing to give up its nuclear weapons. You know, I don't think we've ever actually had a true opportunity to kind of test their intentions, you know, to, to test the intentions that, that Kim committed to in Singapore. But I think denuclearization is still a more likely scenario under a transformed relationship that actually seeks to address the root causes of North Korea's pursuit of nuclear weapons, rather than just trying to roll back some of the transactional costs that North Korea has incurred because of its pursuit of nuclear weapons. So the layers of sanctions and diplomatic isolation. Um, a transformational approach also appears to be more consistent with how North Korea talks about denuclearization as part of a more regional context and then we need for more regional peace and stability. Um, and again, you know, not only does it North Korea appear to favor um, a transformative approach, but also a more incremental, um, a more sort of incremental kind of step-by-step action-for-action sort of process to actually achieve that goal. So how would the United States then kind of pursue engagement with North Korea under a more effective transformational strategy? You know, first we have to ultimately sort of get back to, to talks. Uh, and, and here I think, you know, we could take a, a look at kind of more, more creative confidence building measures, you know, and across a wide array of areas that look at sort of cultural, diplomatic, you know, economic steps to build the relationship and demonstrate the sincerity of a transformational approach. Now, I know there's some confidence building in the next session, so I, I don't want to spend too much time on that but I think they shouldn't solely be about denuclearization so as to ensure that the United States is sending a message that it's sincere about a transformation, uh, a relationship transformation. And as I said, you know, it included sort of an array of actions across uh, multiple sectors. You know, and these could be aimed at de-escalating tensions and building and deepening relationships, uh, particularly between likely sort of negotiators and officials. And again, as, we as the United States pursues CBMs, I think they also have to clearly and consistently be messaging expectations for the entire negotiation. Again, that talking you know, specifically about the initial steps that the United States might be willing to take, the initial package that the US might be willing to put on the table to demonstrate to North Korea that there would be tangible results, that there would be tangible benefits for engagement. All of that is quite critical. And I think something we're not seeing yet you know, from the Biden administration, you know, at this time. And that will also be necessary, I think, to rectify some of North Korea's concerns, you know, post Singapore about not necessarily seeing or getting a clear picture of what those benefits would be. Now, in terms of thinking, you know, then about kind of the overall scope, you know, I, I don't think there's a lot of value in front loading negotiations by nailing down the specifics of exactly what denuclearization would entail, exactly what the transform the transformed relationship would look like, or exactly what a peace regime would look like on the peninsula. But perhaps you know a bit more detail than Singapore um, laid out to kind of establish that roadmap and the basic broad parameters, you know, could be helpful um, in, in, in moving towards that goal. And I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about what that is because I think there was some good discussion sort of in, in the first um, in the first session there. But we can come back to it in, in question and answer. Uh, so then in terms of thinking about kind of the early steps to achieve this roadmap, uh, I think that they should not be solely about denuclearization, because again, this can drive 
um, home that the concern that, that the US is actually going to pivot towards a transactional process and not you know, remain on sort of this transformational approach. And ideally, I think the initial steps from both sides should be negotiated, reciprocal, and of relatively equal value to demonstrate that there's perceived benefit. And I think that this is important if we look at the lessons of Singapore, you know, preceding um, the Singapore summit and after the Singapore summit, we saw steps from the United States and North Korea that certainly would be meaningful in such a process. The moratorium on testing, the moratorium on US exercises, but you know, were they of equal value and were they perceived in the same manner and perceived in having sort of the same effect in sort of moving both sides to the goal? And, and here, I don't think they were. I mean, North Korea clearly thought it should have gotten more for its moratorium. Um, so you know, I think pursuing these steps um, you know, in a more, so in, in ensuring that the early steps kind of have equal value, that they're negotiated and reciprocal, I, I think is important. Now, if we're thinking about kind of actual initial actions on the nuclear side, you know, I, I know I said here that we shouldn't focus solely on denuclearization, but, but that's where I'm going to focus my remarks because that's you know, the area that I work in. Um, I think you know, we need to think about several options kind of depending on where the tensions are, where the current relationship is, and, and again, you know, how much you know, North Korea may be willing to put on the table initially. Um, and I certainly agree with you know, what Bob said that you know, pursuing a declaration at the beginning is, is a non-starter. If we need a more modest step, you know, trying to revisit North Korea's testing moratorium, I, I think you know, would be a good option. You know, we know North Korea has been willing to do this in the past. They may be willing to do so again, uh, in part because it can be reversed quickly if talks fall apart. And I think there would still be value to the United States, given that we're seeing the goals of North Korea's deterrent evolve. Um, so, so certainly, you know, stemming some of their testing now, I think would, would certainly have, have value. Um, now on the US side, I think you know, we need to think carefully about kind of what a package of, of equal value would look like. And here, you know, I think we could do something combining sanctions relief, um, combining perhaps something on the South Korean missile testing side, missile defense deployment, some type of package of both. If we wanna look at something more significant, it might be worth revisiting you know, a version of North Korea's offer from Yongbyon, uh, to put Yongbyon on the table at Hanoi, halting activities at the site, opening up to verifiable dismantlement, um, again, in exchange for some type of package that includes you know, tangible sanctions relief, um, perhaps some changes sort of in the US military presence and, and, and exercises sort of in, in the region. Now, um, if Young Beyond is on the table, you know, there might be a few steps that the United States could pursue um, initially that could help facilitate a more successful ex execution. You know, instead of a full declaration about the site, perhaps just a general list or understanding of the processes that would be necessary in order to think about verification, you know, perhaps mock inspections at a third party location, mock you know, releases uh, detailing kind of what type of information about the verifiable processes that would be um, released in order to ensure kind of public confidence in the process, and maybe even some nuclear cooperation activities um, that could focus on sort of safety and security that again will kind of build ties and relationships. And then I'll just close by saying, you know, we also need to do some thinking about what verification looks like on the US side. You know, how do you verify sanctions relief, for instance? Um, you know, and the experience with the nuclear deal with Iran, I think, suggests that lifting sanctions isn't necessarily enough to achieve meaningful relief. Um, so how do we ensure value? How do we ensure that North Korea sees tangible benefits there? And, you know, we may need to look more at kind of sectoral sanctions on the UN side first, uh, in part to ensure that those benefits are achieved, uh, and in part um, to, because I think there's just, um, there, there's going to be less flexibility on the U.S. side. Um, and I will um, stop there and look forward to, to Terry's presentation and then the time for, for questions. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kelsey. Terry, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks to ISS for the opportunity to come here and, and speak, speak today, uh, for which I'm most grateful, following on my personal views. Uh, as a former member of ISS, no longer, of course, um, uh, but I have been involved in the North Korea project. Um, I, I have two parts to my remarks, which I'll shorten a little bit in the interest of time. Um, is uh, first, as part of the project we undertook, was to try and look at lessons from the past to see how they might be applied in, in this particular case. Um, and uh, the second part, if, if there is a process that's initiated, what would be the 
characteristics of any initial engagement, at least that was an important part of it, before we get to actual the process of dismantlement. So that's the direction I'm going. Uh, I think as we've heard already, uh, North Korea is a unique case. You could argue that for every case, whether it's Iraq or Libya or whatever case you may look at. But, but I think in the only case that you can relate to with um, North Korea, which has operational nuclear weapons, operational delivery means of various kinds, including submarine launched ballistic missiles, one can question or query the actual capabilities and so on, but the potential is clear. And there is a danger with this advancing modernization, which is continuing. Um, so we have to be conscious of the risks. And so we're in a process of risk reduction, uh, I think at, at the very least, which can be dealt with through various forms of arms control before we get anywhere near uh, dismantlement using that word instead of de denuclearization, which is a, a wider term. The only other case is South Africa, which had a handful of weapons, six um, at, 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 at the most. And when one reflects on how long it took to deal with that situation from a leadership that had absolutely committed itself at that time, uh, that's the outgoing apartheid regime, to ridding itself of its nuclear weapons for two reasons. One, it didn't want to hand it over to the, to the incoming regime. And second, the whole uh, rationale for the um, possession of nuclear weapons in their case had actually evaporated with the end, end of the Cold War. So just to look at that case, which I know is well known to most people here. So that's what's required this obvious political will to make, make something happen. Now, um, if, if you look at other cases, you have to be very careful thinking about Libya, for, for example, oft quoted as Andre Lankov has, has said, oft quoted as an example of what happens to a state that gives up its nuclear weapons program, even though it was in its infancy. Um, and Iraq enforced uh, disarmament, completely different, one-sided uh, disarmament. Uh, but uh, one of the lessons from the past is about surprise, not to be taken by surprise. The collapse of the Berlin Wall, uh, for example, in 1989, the collapse of the GDR, for which we were not ready. And even before that, with the changes in the 1980s um, between the then Soviet Union um, and other members of the Warsaw Pact, uh, where there was much more flexibility, suddenly we are suddenly presented with. So uh, we, we need to be ready, and this, I'm just giving the rationale for really thinking through initial steps, because there could be a number of reasons why there's a change. Um, at the extreme end, uh, as Andre said, it could be regime change. We, ca we can't predict what, when and if this might happen in the same way as uh, very few people predicted what was going to happen in the GDR at that time. And so we had this dramatic change. But it could be steps away from that. It could be an internal regime change. In other words, you still have a similar elite, but someone else in charge ready to take a different approach. Um, and... Uh, or the current incumbent, for, for reasons that we, we can't speculate too much on now, could have a change of mind for a number of reasons. So we are in this unpredictable situation, and the really important thing is not to be taken by surprise. So this is the case for really thinking through these, what the initial engagement in a way that, that makes sense. So if we think of it, we can think of it as an arms control process, a confidence building process, and that we have to think through some corresponding steps. I like that term that uh, Kelsey Davenport in an earlier um, uh, publication, Kelsey, I, which I liked and saw very much, corresponding steps is, is, is the best description. Reciprocal is not the right description because of the differences on the 
the various sides, not just two sides, between those who will be directly engaged in any initial steps that might be taken. Then we have to think about what would be appropriate for each side. And to think it through, have the ideas embedded in a context of the security of the whole Korean Peninsula, you could say of the sub-region. So these steps are sub-regional steps, meaning really the uh, uh, Korean Peninsula. And what measures should be included? Um, they, they could include, and with, with all their, with some caution, humanitarian, economic, energy assistance, or all these other things that need to be thought through, and there may be opportunities. Um, and who would be engaged in all this process? Uh, uh, just a quick aside, um, uh, you know, it's showing the possibilities. I was involved with a project in, in North Korea for uh, giving technical assistance for diagnostics for um, drug resistant tuberculosis. They asked for it and it was delivered under a project between the Nuclear Threat Initiative and um, Stanford University's TB Consortium. And uh, this got approval for um, passing over certain li very limited computing capabilities, micro electron microscopes and so on, and a very worthwhile project. Um, but this took place actually during a time when nuclear tests were going on. It shows what, what can be done, but you could then say this was simply pocketed by North Korea. Um, uh, but it depends on the circumstances when you're doing these things, but it does show what is possible. And in questions, I can talk more about that. And the, the final thing before I get to a suggested um, uh, more detailed approach, which I will curtail, is the importance of language. We have to escape the past. And I worry that words like verification have very specific meanings in other contexts. And we have to be careful about the, uh, bringing in baggage from the past. So language is hugely important right at the very start. This is from the high political level. What does denuclearization mean? Uh, I, 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 my interpretation when looking at the Singapore document is denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, but you hear different interpretations of that simple question, but that's at the high political level. But at the lower the sort of politico-technical military level, uh, we have to be careful about bringing in ideas from previous experiences. And there are linguistic subtleties between North and South Korea, which really also need to be taken out. And I, I recognize 38th North have produced a glossary. Um, it, it, it's ongoing work, but something like that needs to be an early part of this. And maybe that's a subject which North Korea and, uh, and others, US, uh, South, and South Korea, Japan, and so on, could all work on. So this, it's really, I think it's such an important thing. So just to end up, uh, 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 just describing the phased approach, I don't think you can think in terms of discrete phases that are purely sequential. You have to think of a series of phases or categories, that's probably a better way of describing it, which maybe they take place, they overlap, but you could have at the beginning, uh, the first, I would say I'm, I'm speaking against myself, but the, the phase that might be at the beginning would be measures that are familiar, relatively easy to implement, that have already been carried out in the North-South Korea context involving South Korea very, very directly, um, but could also involve reinforcing commitments such as um, a freeze on long range only uh, missile tests, but having it uh, agreed and committed to, obviously warhead testing, all the things that we are familiar about, declaration maybe on the declaration or better still a statement of current holdings of uh, weapons grade nuclear material, a statement. And then you, you escape the baggage of the past and maybe establish near the beginning a communications group, including agreeing 
protocols and so on, a hot, a hotline. I know there's a north-south hotline, but we might want to enlarge on that. And, uh, and there's also the issues of large-scale exercises and having an agreement that about declarations by both sides. Um, uh, and so these are things, examples that can be readily um, uh, undertaken near the beginning. Another phase that might be in parallel, this is steps that go beyond making statements and declarations. So this is actually bringing in action, aimed not only at sharing information, but also building trust, including things like, uh, I'll stick my neck out here, starting negotiations on a formal agreement on prior notification of both sides, um, of all sides, I should say, not just two sides. Uh, of military exercise, setting thresholds, these kind of things, but just talking about it, not doing it. Um, maybe visits to sites uh, which are not reciprocal, but an invitation for one side to visit, but not demanding the other side should, uh, uh, should uh, accept, should make an invitation. So not to make it uh, a, a demand that they also invite others. And then you can see how we develop in a set of actions that are predominantly voluntary to moving towards more obligatory actions. Now, uh, I, I think the sorts of things would be uh, familiar to most of you. And all this would get to prepare the ground, if you like, and in fact, there, there are some form of arms control to be ready for what I would call the, the final phase, which is about uh, the actual dismantlement process, if you get that far. But I, we're talking about a very long process that will take time. I think the challenges are maintaining over time uh, the commitments to uh, continue these, not just by the North Koreans, I think doing engaging in this process, predicated on change of political will, of course, in Pyongyang, um, it would be a test of their political will, but also a test for the United States and other partners too, whether they could sustain in this over a long period to get to the point of where actual dismantlement carries on. Thank you very much, Willem. Thank you. Um, we have one question from the online audience, not so much a question, more a statement from uh, Driss uh, Larafi, saying that um, it appears North Korea is actually a nuclear power, just like the nuclear nations, Israel, Pakistan, India, uh, and the legally nuclear armed states. And it's said to say that it's too late to escape for the case of North Korea, the security incentives are just too overwhelming uh, towards nuclear weapons. Uh, with that, let's go to the floor for questions, and we'll start on this side this time. Please go right ahead. Um, hi there, yeah, this is Chad from NK News. Uh, I have a question for uh, Kelsey. Hi, Kelsey, by the way. Um, yeah, I'm just curious why, for your analysis on why you think the Biden administration is so reluctant to inject the presidential level engagement into this topic, because like you said, the US continues to insist that it's open for talks at any time, but it's doing that through the post of the ambassador to Indonesia, which is also double hatted as the US special envoy, coming after Trump level letters and presidential diplomacy for the last several years. Um, the North Koreans probably don't see this in the same light. And so I'm just curious why you think Biden won't, for example, write Kim Jong-un a letter or try and kickstart this through his own office. Thank you. Let me take a couple additional questions before uh, we turn to our speakers. Andrea, did you, yep, yeah, please. Thank you. Um, so this is a bit like being in, locked in a dark room, trying to find a key to a door uh, where after, you know, open that door negotiations start, um, except you don't know where the key is and you don't know where the door is. Um, I think um, I heard uh, a lot of suggestions on potential tactics and what can be done, but no one mentioned 
uh, what I think might be one of the overarching questions, and that's conditions for a peace agreement and of hostilities. At least I didn't hear that being mentioned by anyone. And it appears to me that that might actually be the starting point. If you want to talk about broad parameters of diplomatic engagement, I think you need to put some effort into thinking about the conditions for achieving an end of hostilities, because they are still officially in hostilities, and it's kind of difficult to convince someone to disarm when you're at war. Um, I am still struggling to hear speakers identify a clear role for China. Are they enablers? Uh, are they, are, is China's role in convincing the DPRK to come to the table? Is it, is it a requirement? Or is it more an optional good thing um, to have? To me, uh, it appears like listening to all of you, it's a requirement rather than an optional uh, thing. And if so, we need to think about a China, China engagement strategy in this as well. Final point I have, and this is more a point, and I'm sorry I didn't come up with a, a, a specific question. I think we need to be careful about conflating uh, issues mm -hmm. Uh, with each other um, and reading too much into separate data points. Um, because one note I had here is if nuclear weapons are seen as key for DPRK survival, and I think this is a question directed more to Professor Lankov, whose works I've read and I appreciate and, and respect. But if um, nuclear weapons were key for DPRK survival, then why hasn't the DPRK collapsed before they actually achieved? nuclear weapons capability, which is a fairly recent thing. The DPRK has been around for longer. It occurs to me that this is a new narrative, um, you know, that nuclear weapons are, are essential for DPRK survival. And that, that means the question is, who has created this narrative? I can see how it fits Kim Jong-un and his government. Uh, but I, I also think there is a value not perhaps feeding that narrative too much on my side. Thank you. We'll take just one more from the floor and then, uh, well, I guess, no, we'll, we'll try for two, three. Uh, I think we're going to run out of time, but please go right ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, Carl Dewey from King's College London. Uh, just a quick one. Um, just a lot of the suggested measures uh, will have real impacts on South Korean security, and I feel that's an aspect which hasn't been explored. Um, so could you elaborate perhaps on the small changes um, but what the impacts are from a South Korean perspective and what the South Korean appetite to those changes might be. Thanks. Um, Christina Variani from the Royal United Services Institute. And actually my question directly piggybacks on that. So that's, that's a, a great intervention there, Carl, thanks. Um, I really agree with Kelsey's point on thinking creatively about broader engagement, especially for, for the purposes of trust and confidence. Um, you know, I don't think we can really separate the issue we're talking about today in terms of North Korea's nuclear program and ballistic missiles from the broader regional context. And I think this goes back to the point that, that Beza made in the previous round as well. Um, so I also agree that I, I think it would be great to hear some perspectives, you know, based on Carl's question of how this impacts the South Korean perspective in particular. Um, and I do think it's a bit of a shame we, we don't have those regional perspectives um, as much in, in the conversation today. It's a very US centric, focus, um, and I, I appreciate the reasons for that. But I also think it'd be worthwhile as we're sat in London, thinking about the role that the UK and the EU might be able to play in this. Um, and Kelsey in particular, I, I'd love your thoughts on this based on the fact that you, you made a point about creative confidence building measures. Um, is, is there a role for the UK in Europe? Um, what would the US want from those partners, if anything? What would regional partners want from the UK and Europe, if anything? Um, and is the UK and Europe's role, if there is one, um, is that directly related to the nuclear missile issue, or do they have a role in uh, the kind of broader confidence and relationship building building framework? Um, I could go on, but I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. And it's a, a we were just discussing before the session, uh, Andreas and I, that um, there are several European countries that are actually parties to the conflict, and we often forget that there's still a met a Norwegian colonel in uh, um, Puma. Uh, Han Munjong, who's part of the commission there. And uh, I often at NATO would joke with my Polish colleagues that they were on the wrong side. Uh, they're a part of the, the, the neutral guarantors with the, as the old member of the Warsaw Pact. But with that, let me turn to Kelsey, please. If you could 
answer the questions we heard. We heard a bunch of really great questions. And then um, yeah, any closing remarks you have, please. <laughs> Great, thank you. So there, there are a number of questions. I'll, I'll try to touch on most of them, but I apologize if I missed some of them and, and trying to keep up. Um, so first, Chad, to, to your question, you know, why is Biden so reluctant to inject presidential level engagement? I mean, I, I see a number of factors here, here in Washington. I mean, first, just I think, given the enormity of the challenges that Biden was facing on taking office, you know, North Korea wasn't a high priority in part because Pyongyang didn't try to make itself a high priority, you know, early in the administration. You know, it wasn't forcing Biden to put a lot of attention or political impetus, you know, on the issue. Um, I also think in general, when you look at the Biden administration's approach to foreign policy, you know, th there's, there, there's a real tendency to try to inject kind of more stability and predictability into the processes sort of post-Trump. And I think a real focus on first, you know, ensuring that U.S. alliances are strong, kind of feeling out Japan and South Korea for how they want to approach the issue going forward, um, you know, rather than kind of jump right in kind of with a, with a higher sort of leader level sort of engagement. Um, to be honest, I don't think that this is the most effective approach uh, that Biden could take. I mean, I, I actually think, you know, when we look back at the Singapore summit, the idea of starting uh, negotiations with North Korea, you know, with high level political engagement, you know, to demonstrate sincerity in, in pursuing the transformational relationship was actually an, an, an interesting idea. It's something that, you know, we should think about sort of exploring again, even though now we have to kind of deal with the, the, the legacy of, of, of how Trump pursued that process. But, but ultimately, as I said, I, I think it's an issue about, you know, just not being a priority and, and attempt to kind of return to sort of more, more regular kind of stable and predictable processes. Um, There's also kind of a question about, you know, the peace agreement, um, you know, ending the Korean War, where does this stand? I mean, I, I absolutely think that this should be part of kind of the negotiating package, um, particularly as, as we kind of expand it to look beyond denuclearization and really think about kind of peace and security in, in the region. I mean, I guess the, the question I would have is how much value does North Korea put on this kind of early in the process? I mean, around kind of the, the Singapore talks, it seemed that... Um, despite talking a bit about the declaration that, that, that Pyongyang did not put a lot of political capital on pursuing it early. Um, so where does it kind of fit within that time frame? Are there steps that could be taken earlier in the process that lead towards, um, towards realizing that goal? Um, I, I think is important to kind of think about, but also to kind of feel out sort of North Korea on, on where that might be a, a appropriate and actually advancing these goals. You know, on the, the role of China, um, you know, I think, you know, one could probably spend an entire session just, just on this topic in general. I mean, I agree with some of the earlier comments that there's limited utility in kind of the sanction-centric approach that the U.S. has traditionally pursued and trying to pressure China to, to be more effective on, on actually implementation of sanctions. Um, I actually think it would be very interesting to engage with the Chinese proposal that they've put forward about sort of lifting some sanctions early in the process uh, to demonstrate sort of good, good faith. I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily do that absent, you know, an understanding of a corresponding step from, from North Korea, um, but to try to engage China more as a diplomatic partner as opposed to, you know, coercive pressure, I, I think is, is a better avenue. Um, finally, on, on South Korean security, I mean, I think there are a lot of sort of mixed messages coming from South Korea right now about how they're thinking about security and, and peace building in the region. I mean, you've seen an extensive sort of military uh, buildup you know, extensive investment in missiles, you know, while talking about the need for both sides to decrease provocative actions uh, and, and to in, engage and think more about peace and stability in, in, in the region. Um, so having a frank conversation with South Korea about what they may be willing to put on the table in terms of halting certain capabilities, um, how they're messaging around their capabilities, um, I think that that's critical. Finally, you know, is there a role for, for the UK and, and Europe? I mean, I, I certainly think so, particularly if we're talking about kind of more creative measures that are designed to kind of build trust and confidence in the process. You know, is there a role for the UK and Europe in, in looking at perhaps some of the, the options for a, expanding verification, for expanding, you know, some nuclear security and, and, and safety, again, that kind of build relationships and trust? You know, absolutely. Um, I realize we're running very short on time, so I, I won't go into any more specifics. Um, but I certainly think, you know, thinking more creatively about, you know, where they could engage and inject into the process, um, given 
um, where they have engaged it in the past, given kind of where that expertise is, I think would certainly be critical. So thank you. Thank you. Terry, turn to you for the final word on the panel. Um, obviously, you're, we're pressed for time, so I'll be, uh, I'll be brief. I'll, I'll focus on the, the peace treaty issue, um, which certainly is a background, the whole thing, the whole process, really. And uh, that's really, although I didn't say it, it's embedded in the idea of uh, ensuring that whatever measures are taken, they're taken in the context of the security of the Korean Peninsula and the sub region as a whole. And uh, whether uh, this, of course, I think would bring in all those who are involved in the armistice, including the United Nations, who would be in, that would bring, bring them in as well in this process. So it's quite a complex process, not one easily undertaken. But however, I note the recent statements emanating from Pyongyang, putting a lot of stress on this putting in the context of uh, US in particular hostility from their point of view and saying, well, we need a peace treaty before we can uh, do anything else. I'm, I'm, I'm elaborating a little bit on what was actually said. So I think this, um, the peace treaty issue is something that could be talked about and who would be the parties around the table that would go along maybe near the beginning. It, it would be something required from whatever agreement or statement would be made equivalent to the Singapore Declaration, uh, something like that at the highest level. And that, that's where this issue should sit. And uh, maybe a negotiation uh, should go on with those parties that from an international legal point of view would be, who would be, in other words, the combatants who would be involved in this uh, particular part of it. Uh, so I, I think that's a really important issue, and it, it's something that would, uh, I think, be the headline in, a, in any declaration that might be made to get the situation going. Thank you. All right, so for our third session, we're going to talk about confidence building and verification. And on the panel, uh, Malfred Braut Heghammer from uh, the University of Oslo, also a key person in the Oslo Nuclear Project, which is um, a wonderful set of um, speeches and conferences and workshops. I've enjoyed being part of that. And uh, Nikita Smitovich, uh, former uh, UN Office of Disarmament Affairs official. Um, without further ado, Malfred, please take us away. Thank you so very much. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, with, with all of you in person. Um, so as, as we've heard so far, there's, these are very complex issues, lots of moving parts. So a question in my mind is, well, where, where do we begin? Where should we start? Uh, so in my remarks, I will focus on activities preceding a formal agreement, being agnostic about exactly what kind of agreement that will be, setting out some obligations and activities um, for the future. So what I'll be talking about, um, I think of as warming up activities, warming up as in something coming before the workout. So these warming up activities then come prior to an agreement that set out uh, verification uh, arrangements, et cetera, et cetera. So these warming up activities can help states work through some of the difficult uh, challenges relating both to sequencing, scaling up, including more partners, uh, and issues relating to reciprocity. Um, as we've already heard a few times uh, earlier in the sessions, these are indeed uh, pressing challenges. So what are these warming up activities? Um, these are steps primarily serving as goodwill measures um, and tools to develop a shared working level understanding um, of specific implementation activities. And there's a number of different examples that, that can be included in this. One can be simulated exercises, such as tabletop exercises on scenarios for visits or inspections. It can be invited visits um, for demonstrating specific activities uh, or um, facilities, and also focused expert discussions, uh, including uh, definition of 
of, of key terms to be used in the formal agreement, uh, access rules, sampling, uh, formats for interviews, uh, and so on and so forth. It can include uh, trial inspections. Um, it could that could take place in an actual facility or in a curated facility in a neutral location, perhaps even in the third country. Um, it could even include what are de facto inspections disguised as uh, familiarization visits and trial inspections. Many of these activities um, have been tried uh, in the past and there are several lessons learned uh, for what to do and what not to do that I think are useful in thinking about how to design this warming up stage uh, when it comes to North Korea. I think what, what's important about these activities is that they are very helpful in developing a shared understanding um, of, uh, of the activities that would follow. Um, and they also provide a format for conversation, for dialogue, for identifying misunderstandings and handling these at a very early stage. Misunderstandings are inevitable uh, in these kinds of uh, engagements. And so it is very helpful to find a format to identify and address them uh, early on uh, in a private setting, uh, which I think these warming up activities uh, can actually do. Um, so these activities can help the involved parties uh, develop a shared understanding of what a phased approach to risk reduction, arms control and denuclearization can look like. What is also important about them is that they directly engage the mid-level um, military communities, technical communities directly in discussing the format and also the purpose of various confidence building measures and future verification measures. Um, and perhaps the most important aspect of such activities uh, in the context of North Korea is that it helps the engaged parties begin and sustain a dialogue. Sometimes these kinds of activities are uh, scoffed at as you know, just talking, but honestly, talking is better than, than not talking, uh, given uh, what, what is at stake here and the risks involved. So several of these kinds of activities, as I mentioned, have been uh, explored and used in the past, uh, in particular uh, between the US, the UK, and the former Soviet Union. And it seems to me that those examples are perhaps more applicable in the context of, of North Korea than uh, Iraq and Libya that uh, often, often come up. Um, I'm happy to say more about that in the Q&A, uh, if you like, uh, as both Iraq and Libya are cases that I've studied quite a lot. Um, and I, I too think that they are very, very different from, from what we're looking at uh, when it comes to, to the DPRK. Um, so there are several different, sorry, there are several different and perhaps difficult questions that could be addressed in such a dialogue involving North Korea. North Korean representatives have long indicated that a creative approach to verification is necessary. Well, it would be good to know more about what that might look like in practice, what, what they have in mind and how they see uh, different verification options. Um, and so a dialogue um, focusing on specific options for phasing in preparations for visits um, and confidence building measures could help to sort of clarify some of the problems we're seeing around the sequencing um, and the scaling up um, of this process. Um, it could also help um, compare key concepts uh, with North Korea regarding verification uh, modalities and rules, the format and timing um, and purpose of different kinds of declarations, and also how to, to figure out the issue of reciprocity. Um, this kind of dialogue doesn't have to be very narrowly focused on only nuclear issues. Um, as we've heard in the previous sessions, um, it's important to be to think a little bit more broadly, um, and the warming up phase can also include precisely that discussions uh, helping to prevent tension and contribute to regional um, stabilization. So a couple of the <clears throat> lessons learned from these past experiences involving <clears throat> the Soviet Union is that 
it is actually very helpful for the mid-level uh, military and technical um, uh, leaders to be involved because they can be reassured by what they hear in these conversations. Um, these past examples suggest that uh, in the abstract, uh, talking about verification and modalities and, and so on can be quite uh, off-putting um, and that once the parties actually become involved in a more specific dialogue about what this would be in practice, it's actually reassuring and these military and technical uh, leaders can then go back and report upwards in the chain. Um, in the case of the Soviet Union, um, it seems that this was in fact very important to, uh, to provide more uh, optimism and greater openness within the Soviet system um, as these technical um, and military uh, leaders became confident that this was, these were activities that they could carry out uh, themselves without uh, fearing uh, loss of face or uh, similar uh, issues. So it can actually help to reassure and build greater confidence within the state that you're engaging with. Another important observation is that whether, whether we call these reciprocal steps or not, uh, they don't necessarily have to be precisely equal steps. So the specific activities might be reciprocal in principle, but in practice, they are likely to be geared toward different purposes. Um, for the one party, it might be primarily about learning more about a certain facility. For the other party, it might mean learning more about, about the inspection process and how that would, would work under a future agreement. Unilateral goodwill gestures um, are important because they show a willingness to engage. And I think it's important to take them as such and not to confuse them with what they are not, which is, you know, these are not transparency or verification measures. Um, so it, what's useful about these uh, goodwill gestures is that even if they're not completely convincing in trying to settle an issue, um, they do bring a signal, a willingness to engage that could be taken to a sort of private setting, uh, offstage discussions to, to address um, issues that are causing tensions. So in a future um, warming up stage with, with North Korea, uh, there are several of these activities that would work quite well. Um, such a program uh, or process doesn't demand concessions by the involved parties. These are goodwill gestures, uh, primarily an exploratory discussions. Um, one specific activity that uh, could be included in such a program could be an ice breaking uh, event, uh, such as a um, trial exercise uh, in a curated facility outside of North Korea, where North Korean representatives could be invited to conduct an inspection, searching for what, uh, what they have been told is uh, an illicit item on the site. That in turn could lead to a conversation about uh, inspection modalities uh, and so on, and, and a learning exercise for, for everyone involved um, engaging North Korea directly. So I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, and just with, with a note that, uh, with a happy note, I suppose, which is welcome in, in the context of North Korea, which is that there is a catalog of past experiences that we can learn from. And that one of the main, uh, perhaps lessons from that is, is to approach a warming up phase with, with great flexibility and to be as explicit as possible about what precisely each activity is intended to achieve uh, and to also have the, uh, the format to discuss any disagreements or misunderstandings that are likely to emerge during such a process. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we turn to Nikita, please. You have the floor. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm Nikita Smidovich dealing with this kind of issue for all my professional career. I am actually very happy to hear the presentation by Professor Malfred. Uh, that's exactly the first sort of step that needs to be taken. I'm really impressed how much ideas were expressed around all this kind of expert discussions. 
But what is actually missing is the understanding of not what, what North Koreans are thinking about those ideas. What is practical to them? What is not practical to them? And uh, Manfred mentioned this kind of a warming up exercise. This is exactly what it could be done because it's I just want to reinforce. It's not even a confidence building measure. It's just another channel of communication with between the all interested parties. Again, I agree with uh, Terry that we should really pay attention to words. It's not confidence building. It's not may not build any confidence at all, but it's something that people will be talking about, not on a very high level in Singapore or Hanoi, but on a practical side. It also does not need to assure that there will be even an opening for negotiations or even there will be any kind of a final result at the very end, be it denuclearization, dismantlement, missiles, delivery means, submarines. It's all, it's not that important. The important thing is just that there will be a channel where people can talk and learn a lot without predicting or having a prior agreement to the final stage or to something that definitely needs to and even if it fails it doesn't uh, hurt anyone people will learn more through that process not of actual states but of some kind of interaction between all parties concerned and even if something breaks up uh, no one losing anything okay we had uh, one trial inspection in norway okay so what Okay, we understand better how you look under the table for a nuclear weapon there. Okay, we learned something about it. Even, and through that, there is a lot of experience, sometimes uh, even unimaginable one, or we could not even think through that. As uh, Terry mentioned, sometimes there is a surprises. And you could not even explain. I'm 30 years old uh, from some experience and still could not explain. When we start more opening on the Soviet side, we declared the maximum amount of um, chemical weapons we have, um, 40,000 tons. And the Americans said, we have at every facility so many percentage wise, but they could not disclose how much they have totally. We on the other side could not disclose how much percentage-wise we have on each side. And no one can explain why it happened that way. Apparently, Americans have their concerns. We have our concerns. And that's what we learned. Later on, there was an agreement, and we disclosed both. They disclosed one, and we disclosed the other. Uh, so there are a lot of surprises, sort of. And uh, actually, when some of these issues are clarified on technical issue, I mean, this kind of operational tactical generals and some other heads of the certain facilities, it seemed that things could be done without greatly predicting. No one was predicting in the late 80s there will be definitely a convention banning chemical weapons. But there were two or three even formal agreements between Soviet Union and the United States. Destruction of uh, their stockpiles up to 20%. So there were some practical steps, whether they were implemented or not, it's another story. <laughs> but uh, so what I am actually saying that we should really start something, taking this uh, kind of analogy with the dark room and finding the keys. Uh, we are more that there are a lot of doors and they are open that presented those ideas, how we should move forward. Maybe we don't even need a key. We just push the door and it will open. And one Kaisashi push could be exactly this kind of uh, warming up activities. And uh, that in that case, uh, just concluding my remarks, there should be also two things to keep in mind. First of all, this should not be presented as a continuation of old policies by new means. For example, these exercises should not be used as for propaganda or for accusing someone of not being fully transparent. This is what happened on the previous occasions. 
uh, that people were not believing. They, they were told that Soviet Union is showing standard munition, but they were accusing Soviet Union that they didn't show all munitions. So that should not be used in the same way as to portray that nothing changed. Uh, that only the old policies will work uh, in that regard. The same is also that it might give a more opportunity to engage Koreans by offering them more what to tell. For example, uh, yes, we acknowledge that it might be an intrusive, say, inspections. Yeah, might be. But how you would conduct an inspection, North Koreans, if you will be conducting and searching for absence of nuclear weapons somewhere. What will be your procedures that you will offer? And that will engage them even more. They have to think, not only accept reluctantly what others are suggesting to them, but to come forward with their own ideas. And that will also be a learning exercise for all parties. What could be achieved? Maybe they will offer a great idea. Once we offer to the Americans challenge inspection, any place, any time. Americans were not ready to accept it, finally. So maybe they will offer something that could be accepted. So that's why I think it's a very good idea as the project by uh, your institute suggested, what could be the initial step towards this project, not what could be the final goal of that project. And as an initial step, I fully support the idea or inter presented today by Malfred of this warming up exercises. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So now questions and answers, please go right ahead. Um, I wondered if the, the speakers could give us an indication what might be expected from North Korea by way of confidence building. And I, I was wondering if there was any analogy uh, from the recent talks by the USA and the Taliban uh, 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 in terms of non-aggression by external actors. Uh, so um, in, in that case, uh, Al-Qaeda and ISIS. But uh, one of, in the nightmare scenario uh, for the Americans and the West, uh, North Korea is not only nuclear armed and threatening, uh, but uh, it's proliferating. And uh, some uh, statement on its attitude towards proliferation, uh, a, a more positive statement, would certainly seem to help to build confidence by the North Koreans. I'll just grab a couple more questions before uh, we open to the audience and the table there, and then over to you. Thank you, um, Dr. Edith Howell from Oxford University. Um, we, we've talked about what North Korea could offer that could be accepted. What might that be? I'm just touching on the final speaker on Nikita's points. Uh, Anuradha Damle from Vertic. Thank you very much to both the speakers. Sorry, my mask is caught in my earring. Um, so my question actually reflects back on the last session as well, and it's this notion of verification and the weight that comes with the word and how it's perceived. Um, and when we look at these warm-up exercises, uh, you know, perhaps to do with inspecting or, you know, fissile material counting or something, how do we address this idea of verification in a way that isn't daunting to the North Koreans? Because it has to be addressed in some way or another. The meaning of verification is obviously dynamic and has changed over time. Um, so how do we approach the idea of verification without putting off the North Koreans within that negotiation? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, excellent uh, presentations by both. Thank you. Um, question for um, Dr. Mafford. Um, I guess the previous, you know, on the, on the notion of warm-up exercise, previous, let's say, North Korean goodwill gestures the dismantlement of Pungeri or the disablement of facilities at Sohei uh, were quite poorly received by the international community. There's a degree of cynicism and skepticism about the, um, about the motivation for them and whether or not there were real concessions. So I guess it's a question of, would it have been different if those concessions were part of a, a broader framework? Would that have changed our understanding? And two, can we escape the 
I guess, tyranny of expectations, um, that cynicism regarding any sort of gesture made. Um, thank you. Um, I do not think that we are, it seems that we are not lacking options and, 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 and TCBMs in, in this talk. I think what we are lacking is, is almost like the political will to initiate these activities that Malfred had, had talked about. And which made me think about the issue of trust. When we think about the issue of trust, we generally think about implementation of activities and there is no trust. So how can we implement those activities? But perhaps trust needs to be embedded even prior to coming to that activity stage, um, which is you know, not the process, not the implementation, but prior. Um, so the question is, is really about, um, you know, um, what should we be thinking about trust prior to taking the activities? What is required to build trust in order to even initiate those activities? Um, and then a second question that I have uh, is more about, um, or maybe I should just give, give up on that, but it's, it's more about unilateral actions. We mentioned that it's not reciprocal. Um, so are there any unilateral actions that the West, West or the United States or the allies can take that can also help to build that trust, if it makes sense. Thanks. Just before I turn to the speakers, I'm always curious when the word trust comes up in arms control. As someone who's worked on arms control in my career, I've never seen two countries that trusted each other enter into any arms control agreement. It's the absence of trust that requires arms control. And in fact, all arms control agreements are designed with the idea that one side or the other will cheat and you will have the opportunity to catch them and discuss it or at least detect it early enough that you can react. It goes right to the core of it. I, I think instead of trust, I, I guess what we mean is enough of a, um, uh, a belief that the other side has shared interest in a positive outcome. But I just, I always, I, I just always, just as an arms controller, I, my, the, bris, the hairs on the back of my neck always go up when someone says, well, but we have to trust them. And it's like, no, 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 no. This is one of the arguments people have a lot now about, well, with Russia, we don't have trust. And it's like, we didn't trust them in the 70s or 80s either. I mean, that, I didn't see a lot of trust between the US and the Soviet Union, but we did have, I think, an idea that we had a shared interest, a shared outcome. Is that more what you mean? Yes, it is. Yes and no. So we don't need to trust, right? Trust by but verify and all the concepts. So we don't need to trust. But what, what you need is, in a way, yes, a shared interest, but also you need to have that party sit on the same table with you regardless whether you trust them or not. So you need to initiate a dialogue with them. And that dialogue could be based on different frameworks. And the point that I'm say, saying in here is that we're talking about all these activities without actually realizing the primary stage, which is what is the type of dialogue that North Korea would be you know, interested in engage, engaging or the Western countries or you know, United States or other parties are interested in engaging. We're almost starting in the, in the middle process. These are the activities. Yes, but you know, what, what does it take to take us to those activities because there's no political will. So you, you don't need to think about trust. It's, it's just a, you know, a word, a catchphrase perhaps, but I'm more interested in the primary phase. Right. Okay, sorry to, uh, sorry to interrupt with that, but hopefully that's given you plenty of time to think about all these incredibly rich questions we have. We have six questions, so not for Thank you so much. Um, and um, I will try to be brief because I really want to hear from uh, Nikita Smirovich as well on all of these important questions. Um, so, um, so the discussion about trust is clearly very important. And I think that um, in, in this particular context, distinguishing between activities prior to a political agreement, formal agreement, and after are very important uh, before such an agreement, if it is made. Uh, the warming up phase uh, is primarily about signaling goodwill that can help uh, give the uh, increase the uh, the confidence, if you like, among the parties that the others are engaging in a serious manner and are prepared to discuss this in, in substantial terms and include gestures that actually, uh, and here we can look at examples such as the uh, from the 1980s and the chemical weapons example, uh, Shikani visit in 87, for example. Um, so I think that there are uh, many 
concrete options that can be uh, included in um, in addressing this uh, so-called trust deficit, which is, yes, it's always there, but sometimes it's bigger and sometimes it's it's smaller. Uh, and in this particular context, it, it will be a challenge. So, so this, the activities and measures that I'm talking about do not presuppose a great deal of trust. Um, they are about signaling a willingness to engage and affording everyone most notably also North Korea, the opportunity um, to, to provide those, those signals and come with some unilateral steps that are not to be confused with verification or transparency, but are substantive steps um, that can help take us um, to, towards a more productive um, set of engagements. And I think that points to the other important questions about these past unilateral steps that the DPRK has made uh, that have not been perhaps widely applauded by, by everyone. Um, I think that in, in my mind, those kinds of unilateral steps uh, fit well within the warming up framework where we see them as uh, unilateral steps of, of some you know, limited act, some limited insight curated to be sure. Uh, we of course do not confuse this with verification activities, but if we see these activities for what they are, unilateral steps, signals, I think they are important and they do provide a, a starting point uh, as long as we see them for what they are and don't criticize them for not being something else. And that I think leads to another point about some of these um, sort of warming up uh, exercises from the past where one party provides more uh, access in a certain facility, for example, and the visiting parties criticize uh, the, the host for not giving them access to everything. Perhaps there, there's a misunderstanding then about the, the format and the purpose of that visit. Uh, and working out those kinds of misaligned um, expectations uh, or disagreements is an important part of this uh, warming up kind of framework. Um, and how to, uh, the, the very important question about how to introduce um, uh, verification practices and uh, concepts and, uh, and so on into uh, a warming up uh, kind of dialogue in a way that isn't daunting. Um, it seems from the, catalog of experiences from the late Cold War that the best approach is perhaps just to try it out and talk about it in specific terms with those who are working in the facilities that might be those that are visited, for example, um, to show uh, in, in practice, whether it's in a tabletop simulation or an actual visit in a curated or actual facility, what different inspections are geared to do an inspection could be geared to find uh, an alleged uh, prescribed uh, capability or activity, or it could be just to get a sense of the, what the facility is for, uh, what, uh, what the normal working operations are. So I think just going through the, the different kinds of practices in, in very concrete ways and terms are perhaps best to, to help the, all of the involved parties um, understand what, what this is. And, it seems that this can actually often help to reassure uh, those who know that they will be visited, but the visit might be perceived as an inspection, that they can, that they are comfortable with, with the procedures that, that are involved here. So I think I'll stop there, but really enjoying this, uh, this conversation. And Nikita, I'll turn to you in just a second, but I would also know it's, it, it's very interesting. The South Koreans have a agency called the Korean Arms Control Verification Agency. And they actually conduct with the United States mock CFE inspections, mock uh, inspections under the Conventional Armed Forces in Europe Treaty, I think every year. Um, and this is part for them a process of understanding what arms control looks like uh, and uh, how to set themselves up, whether it's in a permissive environment or in a hostile environment. Um, but I wonder if there's a way to induce dialogue along that way. Could South Korea then teach North Korea a thing or two about arms control verification, or would that taint it? I don't know. It's very I wrestle with that myself. Nikita, can I turn to you, please? Yeah, I support what Manfred just mentioned, uh, and I will uh, try to answer all the questions in, in one. Again, that's about words that we are using. Uh, Warm-up exercise does not suggest any confidence-building measure. It's not about building trust. It may end up differently but no one will be hurt. It's more to find if there is any interest 
in those kind of activities. Of course, in case of North Korea, this will all be monitored very closely from the very top, what is going on. Uh, so, and you learn a lot through that exercise. Uh, Manfred mentioned the Soviet generals learned a lot, meaning we are not stupid people. We can tolerate those inspections. We can even outsmart the Americans, for example, and still hide Novichok, for example. So they are not afraid of, when you have a discussion on academic terms at all, oh no, it could not be done. Any place, any time could not be done. May I suggest a very simple step forward? South Korea, through that agency, allocate one mock facility, former, I don't know, aircraft or former production site, which is doing nothing, and invites both North Korea and United States to inspect it in a mock inspection. Saying, if you are looking for something that you are looking, let's try it over here. It does not commit anyone to anything. The best outcome that North Korea will be interested, say, okay, we can do that. And then we can discuss many scenarios, what you are looking for, nuclear weapons or production facility or whatever you are looking for, documents, I don't know, hiding places. But they will have to show that they are interested in such a, an approach. It could be several stages approach. First could be a tabletop exercise. Let's do it around the table, how it will be all organized, done. We play different roles. And then we can do it on a mock site, specially prepared site for such. Or then then we can, at the last stage, could go to a real site. OK, it's more also a training of people. But through that, you will may discover that maybe North Korea is not that much concerned about declaring certain things. They are very free to discuss certain things. Some things may be more harder to get from them. Uh, so that's kind would be. And then one can see whether this is of interest to them. And even not, what will be the pretext of rejecting it? because it does not provide the, any engagement from their side in the real sense. They are not disclosing weapons. They are not showing them. They are not showing any facilities. They are just coming and inspecting a mock site. And that will be really an indicator if they have any interest in such a kind of a dialogue or such kind of an engagement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I was. I'm also mindful that the United States itself had to prove the concept of arms control. And one of our colleagues has written about uh, Project Cloud Gap, which did nuclear verification, but also did conventional verification. There were field test exercises yeah. where the US actually went to um, bases in the south of the United States to see what was verifiable and how to do it. And then took those lessons to the UK with uh, field test which then became the NATO experiments on uh, arms control verification to teach the allies what their obligations would be. And this was, this was a process of learning that started in 1963 and lasted all the way through MBFR negotiations into the 70s and 80s. And then the, the teaching and learning process that went back and forth between the US and Soviets about how to conduct these things. So it's a, it's, it's a non-trivial exercise and it is a way, as I think a bunch of the speakers have said to, um, to see if there's some real interest and to start building those uh, that muscle memory on how to how to actually inspect and verify things. But we also have to be mindful that verification is tough. And as one of our um, online attendees has mentioned, uh, even in US Russian arms control, there's been many cases of mistrust and hiding and spoofing. And that this is this is a thing that goes on uh, with some regularity. Uh, Andres, you want to come back? Yeah, um, not necessarily on cloud gap. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think it was a, a remarkable exercise and also one that I wasn't aware had yielded results so long after it's, uh, it, it ended. Uh, it ended prematurely with a helicopter crashing, I think, and, and some people losing their lives. So it wasn't politically expedient to con continue it. Uh, on the point of trust, you know, uh, it's, it's quite interesting. You don't have to trust your opponent, but you do have to trust that there is a commonality of interest 
uh, and I think that is at least when I um, talk about trust, that's that's what I refer to. Um, because make a make a simple thought experiment here. If the DPRK uh, agreed to an agreement with the intent to deceive you, and yes, they can hide non-compliance, but they can't hide it forever. But if they were to agree that, um, they would have already done so, um, and they haven't. So I think it's very important to recognize that the DPRK is not agreeing to this because they, they are not confident about whether or not they can deceive inspect inspectors, uh, but it's a, a fundamental um, problem with, with you know, the topic of agreement, what to be agreed. Uh, I think uh, verification and monitoring uh, also have two other uh, very important functions. One is to demonstrate your compliance year on year. So once you have entered into an agreement, you demonstrate that you're doing fine and you're kind of showing your hands uh, to your opponent and you're doing that routinely. And I think there's an important factor in that. And the third most important uh, factor in my mind is to safeguard against changing circumstances. Just because the government you agreed with happened to be a democracy it doesn't mean that it's a democracy 10 years or 20 years from now, but the agreement still needs to remain. And so verification allows you to continue uh, the operation of the treaty without taking too much in, reading too much into changing political circumstances. And I think it's from that perspective, I think those warm up, warm up exercises are quite, it's an interesting thought. You know, you need to warm up to something and the DPRK will ask, so if we're warming up, what are we warming up to? Big exercise here. Uh, um, and, you know, there is something to be said about warming up when relations are, are ice cold at absolute zero. You don't want to take too many risks at that. You want to do it gently and perhaps not too ambitiously. Having said all of this, it's still a good idea. Um, I mean, modalities, I think, can be discussed, but the concept itself is valuable. So thank you for, for raising that. Okay, so um, if I could just add on to this very interesting discussion about trust, I mean, it, Jeffrey Forden has written very interesting uh, analyses of working with, in broad terms, denuclearization with states that um, you think want to cooperate, like South Africa, and states that you think are unlikely to want to cooperate, like like Iraq. Um, and and I think his work um, uh, emphasizes the the point that we we always have to live with uncertainty whether we trust or don't, and we have to live with the, the likelihood that the, the states are not interested in declaring everything, certainly not all at once, and to, to find a way, a format for first, you know, the warming up, and then later on post-agreement verification arrangements that, that can live within that reality um, is challenging but important, and I think that, again, his, his work emphasizes the point that was made earlier that um, we shouldn't expect sort of complete declarations, historical declarations, um, and that it's particularly important to, to not see that as a fix for, for certain trust issues down the line. Um, so so just, just a thought that, that struck me there. Thanks. Well, thank you. That brings us to the end of the session. And uh, we'll now have concluding remarks by Bob Gallucci. I can't think of a better person to sum up and to, to close the meeting out. But before I throw it to you, uh, one question that I had that has come up in my mind repeatedly throughout this discussion is, if I'm cynical, if I'm, if I'm putting myself in the shoes of the North Koreans, why would I even bother believing in any US approach? Because uh, you know, every time the administration changes, it seems the approach changes. And uh, you know, whether or not this is true, it's my impression that you know the fuel, oil, the heavy fuel oil deal, and the reactor deal, uh, you, you know, from their point of view, we're, we we don't follow through on our words. So how can we build a stable approach on this topic? How can we make sure that we have cross-party agreement before we engage with the North Koreans? Because I think that would be for them, the entering signal that we were serious to know that a new administration wasn't going to overturn the approach of the previous administration, because otherwise they're only dealing in four or eight year chunks of American policy, and then boom, they get a new policy, they get to see what concessions they can grab, and then they can run off. So with that uh, hopefully provocative question, let me turn to you, Bob, please. 
Um, so uh, let me start. I'm not going to sum up everybody's comments, obviously, but I do have a, 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 a thought here. Let me start with, with the question. And it's the, it's the matter of the durability of American assurances or commitments about anything. It, it seemed to me that we were, we, the United States, were no worse off than any other country uh, just because we had elections every four years and we could have a change in party every four years that uh, countries would be always expected to follow their interests. And if their interests changed and they were vital interests, they would follow their newer interests. And the United States was no different in the international system. But that we understood partially because we had a, a, um, a relatively unique position in terms of the way power is measured in, in the world. And, for a long time, we and the then Soviet Union uh, dominated international politics from that perspective. All right, uh, that led, to, uh, among other things, to the United States um, in the context of establishing alliances, wanting to be credible with those alliances and constantly working on reassuring first the Europeans and then eventually Europeans and NATO, and then eventually our allies in Asia. And I'm thinking here particularly of the ROK of Japan and of Australia. So I, I, I see the United States as, as like other states with respect to the vulnerability of its commitments, but maybe a, a little more serious about underlining how um, important they are to us and our security, aligning, in other words, assurances with interests. This, for me at least, changed with the presidency of Donald Trump. And I think many of us were stunned at, uh, to use a word uh, earlier used, at the transactional nature of um, President Trump's view of our alliances. Uh, we worked hard over decades to persuade countries that they were not transactional, that changes here, changes there, we're not going to fundamentally change uh, the, America, the credibility of America's alliance commitments of the nuclear umbrella, as it's sometimes called. But I think Donald Trump did a lot to undercut that. And, and I don't think it was understood by the, his administration I don't mean nobody in it, but by him, really. And But I think it has been since, and there is a long road back, in my view, to the United States gaining, uh, again, a kind of credibility, I think, that it had earned over a period of time. We are not where we need to be, and I think uh, President Biden, a very traditional uh, a traditionalist in terms of his approach to uh, international relations from the American perspective, and I think he will start us down that road, but it's going to take a while. And I think we'd be silly of us not Americans not to admit that. Uh, more broadly on this session, which I found incredibly interesting and useful, and I thank you for it. I think in a way we were set up by Professor Lankoff uh, and his comments, which struck me as classically realist and for that rang true. I, I felt comfortable with what he said, even though it was undercutting to some of what I said, but it, it, his, his characterizations sounded right to me. Uh, and I can't, I can't walk away from that. So I, I have been sitting here in part trying to think of how to reconcile that with what I would like to see happen, including by the way, keeping the goal of denuclearization, but not just as window dressing, but as the serious plausible objective, if not likely objective being realized. It seemed to me the way we get from um, Professor Lankoff to a, a view of what is a more uh, uh, optimistic posture uh, is through the connection and contrast that uh, Kelsey Davenport uh, drew between uh, transformative and transactional uh, approach. And uh, she argued in her way um, 
passionately for the transformative over the transactional. And I think that's what I was talking about when I said the United States needs to adopt normalization as its objective. It can't be we trade um, normalization for denuclearization. We want and should want normalization. We should want to transform relations in Northeast Asia, fundamentally the DPRK, the USA relationship, but with that will come a North-South change. And I'm fairly sure a change that Beijing will have to cope with. Uh, and these will be changes, I think, for the better. I, I'm not predicting um, peace and justice breaking out all over the international community here, because I am informed, as I said, uh, in my bones by uh, Professor Lankoff, uh, who, who is right about the character of the international system. I think our task is to figure out how we overcome the fundamental drives of states in a state of nature. Here I come to Nikita's point, <laughs> at least as I took it. I, I like the idea uh, of increasing in some way the engagement with North Koreans to find out what the North is thinking and wants and will do. We have always thought we'd be better off in international politics if we understood each other better. You know, some people like Kenneth Waltz like to point out, uh, he was my professor as a, as a graduate student, that the most vicious and horrible wars are civil wars where people understand each other quite well. I get that, but I still believe, I still have a, a, a liberal's heart, and I still believe that we would do better to, uh, to engage more with the North, to find ways of doing what the United States and the Soviet Union really did for quite a long time in their formal arms control engagement, uh, learn more about one another. I, I think we need more contact with the North and the North needs more contact with us. Uh, and we ought to all be in the business of promoting North-South engagement as well. Anyway, I think this was, as I said, a very useful, helpful, insightful uh, set of comments, and I'm grateful for having been included. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for that excellent, excellent summary and a great way to take us out with a little bit of hope, uh, a little bit of optimism on a topic that is uh, entirely too depressing. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you to the online audience for sticking with us. And I uh, hope to do more events like this, publish more papers on this, think more, but actually get out there and do some real engagement. Thank you all. Have a great day.